Our guest today is the president of the Chicago Board of Education. He is a product of the Chicago Public Schools and a parent of a Chicago Public School graduate. Our guest today's lifetime goal is giving back to the community and the school system that laid the foundation for his success. He is a cum laude graduate of Southern University in Baton Rouge with a degree in accounting. Our guest today is married with two children. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the City Club of Chicago, the president of the Chicago Public Schools, Rufus Williams. Rufus. <clears throat> Thank you, Jay. Good afternoon, everyone. I truly thank each and every one of you for coming. This is the first time that people have actually paid to come and hear me speak. <laughs> and so I brought my mom here to bear witness to such an occasion. <laughs> when the offer was made back in July for me to come and speak, I was asked, what was it that I would talk about? My answer was clear and direct. I don't know. I didn't know if I was going to have to explain the status of the current teacher strike or where we were in the negotiations. I didn't know if I was going to have to explain why school didn't start on September 4th and when it actually was going to start. I didn't know if I was going to have to explain why attendance was down or why our test scores had dropped or why we still hadn't filled the 150 principalships that came up new this year because of retirements and other things. Well, I am happy that many of these sensitive items have been worked out. We reached an agreement with our unions with deals that were fair for all. Last week, the Board of Education <coughs> approved a five-year deal with the Chicago Teachers Union that shows that we value our teachers and we value the work that they do and what they provide to our system and our families, and we're proud of the five years of stability that we now have in Chicago public schools. I'd like to personally here thank Marilyn Stewart and truly thank um, Jim Francis, Charlie Rose, and the team that worked on making that happen for our, for our students. <laughs> School opened September 4th as planned. We have the highest attendance ever at 93%. While that's good, that's not good enough. That means over 28,000 students didn't show up on the first day of school. That's a problem. We need them there. We need them there every day. We need to teach them. We have principals in all of our schools, and we've posted our highest test scores ever last year. And while all those things are good, I still have a few messages that I want to share today. First and foremost, I believe fervently that every child can learn and achieve, no matter their zip code, race, creed, color, or religion. I believe in the power of parents and that they have the first and greatest impact on who and what their children will become. I believe that the greater community must step in and assist when parents have difficulty in getting their job done. We are, in fact, our brother's keeper. I believe that the collaboration of parents, teachers, administrators, and the community can effectively improve the possibilities for our children. I believe in clear lines of authority, responsibility, and accountability. And I believe that leadership makes a tremendous difference. For the last 14 months, I have served as the president of the Board of Education of the third largest school system in the nation. Until just before I was appointed, I never thought I would be here, never lobbied for it, and never expected it. Nonetheless, I am thrilled to be in this position. And although I didn't plan for it, I subconsciously prepared for it. I attended Chicago Public Schools from kindergarten through 12th grade. I went to Wright Junior College. I attended a four-year college. And I know what it was like to try to get a job right out of Orr High School with only my high school diploma in hand. The only option I had was Burger King. I am the father of two children. My daughter, Jada, is here this afternoon. She's
Jada is a graduate of Tulane University and a nurse at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. So be nice to me because she may see you someday. <laughs> it was mentioned my son is a Chicago Public Schools graduate. He's at Yale University and we're very, very proud of him. These, these things have happened because in my family, we value education and all the things that I said that I believe. And this is probably a good time for me to recognize my wife, Jay, who's also here this, this afternoon. And she does all the things that you would think that a wife does to make sure that I get all the things done that I'm supposed to do. I have served on the board of two local private schools, Providence St. Mel and Francis Parker. I've been a local school council member and a local school council president at Whitney Young. I have also been the president of a substantial social service agency, the Better Boys Foundation. So while I haven't planned for this role, I think I'm very well prepared for it. The mayor is responsible for our schools, and he makes it very clear to me that my box is right below his in this effort. I recognize that responsibility, and I attempt to conduct myself and manage our system accordingly. We have very, very good people in Chicago public schools, led by Arnie Duncan, who's boycotting because I didn't make it here for his lunch, <laughs> <laughs> and Barb Reese and Watkins from our education side, who's also boycotting because she's lobbying, she's aligned with Arnie. Um, I'm thrilled that we have Hill Hammock also in our system to really make sure that the administrative aspect is taken care of. And I would begin to name all the people from Chicago Public Schools that are here, but I, what I will do is ask them to stand and be recognized, because this is the team that really makes everything happen. Thank each of you for your support, and thank each of you for your work. We all recognize our responsibility, and I work to ensure that we are appropriately accountable. We want that. We're doing heavy lifting, and this is hard work. We have all gone into it knowing that it isn't easy, but it doesn't have to be this hard. Some things must change, and you can help. I want to talk to you about three things. The first thing is violence, particularly violence against our children. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask this question. Where is the outrage? Last year, 34 of our children were killed, murdered. 34 children. It makes me sick, it makes me sad, and it makes me mad. 34 children from the ages of 9 to 19. Where is the outrage? Some of these children were on their way to school. Some were on their way home from school. Some were in their homes. Some were beaten to death. Some were strangled. Some were stabbed. 28 of 34 were murdered at the wrong end of a gun. I ask you, where is the outrage? I know and I knew that this work would be hard, but I never expected to go to as many funerals. I never expected to go to as many memorial services. I never expected to speak at so many anti-violence rallies and I never expected to march so much. Where is the outrage? I have sat and wondered how that baby felt in the last moments of his life at such a young age. Shouldn't we as adults have done more to protect him? I have felt a degree of sadness that a parent must feel knowing that their child is never coming home. I have cried hard and I have cried out loud. And I continue to wonder, where is the outrage? These are our children. If any of them is unsafe, then all of them are unsafe. If we can't protect the youngest and most vulnerable members of our society, how can we be safe? We need to get guns off the street. We need to get guns off the street. We need to get guns off the street. The next thing I want to touch on is local school councils. LSCs were formed in 1989, the 1989 School Reform Act. In 1988, our schools were declared by then Secretary William Bennett to be the worst in America. In providing a level of responsibility, and if you recall, at that time, Chicago was very much about community involvement and community empowerment. 
Local school councils were developed to have six parents, two community representatives, two teachers, the principal, and a high school student comprise the council. They are responsible for approving the budget, developing and approving the school's academic plan, and hiring the principal. Imagine for a moment, if you will, that you have a responsibility for a chain of hotels or restaurants or any decentralized business. Imagine that you're responsible for the hotels, but you don't have the authority to decide who the general manager will be. Imagine that the general manager is given a four-year contract, but the contract is given by those who sleep in the hotels. And imagine that they only have to, they only require to sleep in the hotels for two years, but if they decide to leave early, they can. There are no standards on who stays at the hotels. They may be business people, they may be transients, they may be politicians. Depending on the address, they will very likely be unequal. You don't pick the GM, but you're responsible for the profits and losses, the cleanliness, the safety, and the room service. But you don't pick the general manager. It's a little bit difficult for you to manage this chain in this situation. This is a situation that we have with local school councils. Not all general managers are bad. Not all local school councils are bad. But this is a flawed system. The situation with Geraldine Jones and Curie High School was not an aberration. There are many other difficult, similar situations that we are managing. There are many examples of adults getting in the way of the progress of children. Those of us who are responsible for the schools simply ask that we have the authority because we have the accountability for them. Chicago Public Schools is known for reform. One of the reform efforts is local school councils, but this is one of the reform efforts that not one group, system, area has bothered to replicate. We are the only system in the world that has this kind of a governance structure. It must be fixed, it must be adjusted, it must be changed where we currently are so that we can best operate our system for the benefit of our children. I'm here today with one other very clear and very simple message. Please hear this. Illinois education funding system is broken and it must be fixed immediately. We are all losing because of it. Our children are losing the opportunity for the high quality education that is promised in our state constitution. The business sector is losing because it doesn't have the workforce that it needs. The taxpayers are losing because they pay too much in property taxes under the current system. Educators are losing because they don't have the resources to do their jobs. Everyone loses, except of course, the politicians who beat their chest and proudly display their anti-tax credentials. The politicians keep winning because the voters reward them with re-election and punish the people with the courage to admit that the state needs more revenues and takes the steps to generate more revenues. I'm not an expert on the state budget, but when the transit system is on life support, when the state has no program to fix schools, roads, and bridges, when the pension system is collapsing, and when schools across the state have to go hand in hand year after year down to Springfield and explain why education is important, something is profoundly wrong. I just finished my first year as president of the Chicago Board of Education. In the last year, I've learned a lot. I've learned that our ability to bring positive change into an enormous school system is limited by many factors. I've mentioned parenting, which is too often uneven, local school councils, and violence. But this funding thing is a really big deal. We are responsible to our students. There are over 400,000 of them. That's about 10 times the number of people that will fill Wrigley Field in the upcoming World Series. <laughs> As we all know, they are not designed to walk in straight lines and take directions. Each child is unique with unique needs and unique challenges. And our vision is that the Chicago public school system should be flexible enough to meet the unique needs of every single child. Not, ev not just the average students from good homes, but all the children, no matter what their circumstances. The fact is 
Despite underfunding by the state, we get closer and closer to that vision every day. More and more children get preschool, more and more children get tutoring and after school programs. More and more children attend schools that meet their special needs, whether they are gifted or whether they are struggling. And the overall trends are moving in the right direction. Test scores are up, attendance is up, graduation rates are up, and they keep going up year after year. We're opening 15 to 20 new schools each year and transforming those that are underperforming. The quality of our teachers and principals is rising as well. We get 10 resumes for every opening. We hire thousands of teachers with advanced degrees from some of the best universities in America. And some of them willingly chose to work in some of our toughest schools. I am truly, personally grateful to each and every one of them. We still have many challenges, of course, like closing the achievement gap, fixing the neighborhood high schools, getting more kids into college, and keeping them safe during non-school hours. The bottom line, however, is that we can only afford to do so much with the money that we have. We cannot give all of our children the education that they really need and deserve. And children cannot keep waiting while the state keeps delaying. Illinois, Illinois keeps sending generations of children into the world without the skills that they need. And we end up paying the price in crime, incarceration, welfare, and other social costs. The opportunity cost in terms of business development that can happen because our workforce is, under, uh, is unprepared and underprepared is incalculable. And the question I think about is, what can we do to change this overall dynamic? It seems that we've tried every possible argument. The moral argument that society has a sacred obligation to educate the children has not moved the needle. The education argument about what kids need and what it costs hasn't moved the needle. Even a state-appointed panel says the state doesn't do enough to provide a quality education. If they won't take their own advice, why would I think they're going to take mine? The public policy argument, analyzing the cost and benefits of income taxes versus property taxes, or education versus incarceration, hasn't moved the needle. The equity argument, that some districts spend only $5,000 per pupil while others spend over 20,000 also hasn't worked. And the fact that there is a racial impact to underfunding is yet another important argument. But it too has not resulted in funding reform. You can even try the pure safety argument. More education means less crime and more time in school means the children are safer. But that won't get us there either. Politics trumps every one of these arguments. So the next question is, What's a political strategy for funding reform? Is it a PAC? Do we need to target legislators in the next year's elections in order to get their attention? How do we change the political climate in Illinois so that an anti-education vote has more political potency than an anti-tax vote? That may be unreal unrealistic, but we have to look at these questions because we cannot keep going in the way in which we're going. Everyone knows that the state is in trouble. I am not a prognosticator, but we all know that at the pace we're going, eventually the pension checks will bounce, the bridges will collapse, the D CTA trains will derail, the corporations will flee, and the schools will decline. We are like a man who jumped off the roof of a 10-story building. When he passed the second floor, he said everything's okay so far. One thing I have learned in the past year is that the truth is becoming more and more elusive. One truth is that we just got a record increase in education funding from Springfield, and I salute the legislator, legislature and the governor for that, given the current circumstances. Some people might say that we ought to be satisfied with that. But another truth is that we spend $4,000 less per pupil than New York. Multiply that by 400,000 students, and we're talking about $1.6 billion. Because we have such a short school day, children in New York spend seven weeks more in school. Multiply that over 13 years from kindergarten through high school, and you're talking about 91 additional weeks of schooling that they get before they get to college. That's like two additional years of school. It's also true that Illinois ranks among the lowest states in America in terms of the state contribution to education funding. And, we, and that compared to what most other states, we have a, a low tax burden. Finally, 
It's true that gross inequity in education funding perpetuates gross inequity in life. A child in, Har a child in Harvey or on the west side starts out with so few advantages, but our system compounds, those, compounds the inequity by giving the child with all of the advantages the better education. September 4th, 2007 was our first day of school. It also marked the 50th anniversary of the Little Rock Nine. The nine courageous students who under military guard integrated Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. The issue of integration and the victory of Brown versus the Board of Education 53 years ago had absolutely nothing to do with the expectation that little black children would be smarter and better able to learn if they sat next to little white children. It was about equity. It was about equity and opportunity, and it was about equity and funding. It has been over 50 years, and we are not there yet. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask the question again. Where is the outrage? I understand that the govern government cannot level the playing field when it comes to family connections, but at least we should compensate for these inequities by giving the children without the advantages a comparable education. So while I am deeply grateful to our lawmakers in Springfield for the dollars that we have received, including this year's record, sat record increase, I am far from being satisfied. And while I am yet confident that even under the current circumstances, we will continue to make the progress in the classroom and close the achievement gap, I am not satisfied. In fact, I am, very, I am the very opposite of satisfied. I am outraged. The more determined, I am more determined than ever to challenge the politicians, the tax hawks, tax hawks, the naysayers, and the status quo, and keep on fighting for school funding reform. This is a fight for children, and this is a fight for our future. It breaks my heart to think that some of our children will go through life without a real chance to reach their potential. Because the adults, you, me, and our elected officials were unwilling to do what was right and what was necessary. In all of these discussions about state education funding, I never heard anyone say that we did not need reform. I never heard anyone say that the current system is fine. Everyone agrees we need to do something, but no one is willing to stick his neck out to choose the right plan and build the consensus to make it work. It's easier to pay lip service and lay the blame when the process breaks down. Arnie stood here a few weeks ago and said he wants to bring 100,000 people down to Springfield in the spring in support of school funding reform. That's one strategy, and I'm all for it. There are also some lawyers who are looking at whether or not we can do what New York did, where a coalition of community groups sued the state for underfunding the schools. Last year, after a 14-year legal battle, they won and the politicians in New York agreed to boost school funding, $5 billion. Apparently, the Illinois Supreme Court has struck down similar lawsuits three times in the past, so we have to develop a new novel legal theory to make this work. But I'm open to any and every strategy we can think of to advance this issue, because I believe education <coughs> represents the very heart and soul of a healthy society. It is our highest purpose, and it is our greatest achievement. Every month, I chair the Board of Education's regular meeting, for, and for two or three hours, people come before us and speak. Some of you may have seen this on Saturday when you were flipping channels. They come and they criticize us, they question us, and they challenge us. Occasionally, they even threaten us. I'm always struck by the passion and the emotion that they bring to these meetings. Their hopes and dreams for their children are right on their sleeves for everyone to see. And they're looking at us to make those dreams real. And when we fall short, which we sometimes do, they don't hold anything back. I refuse to tell those parents that I'm sorry about their particular issue, but we just don't have the money to address it. I refuse to throw my hands in the air and say, I just can't do anything to help you. That is not a responsible answer. That is a cop-out. What I would do instead is hand them a phone book 
with the numbers of our state legislators and the governor, and I will ask them to call them every single day. I'm going to tell them to register to vote. I'm going to explain to them how to look up the legislative record of their elected officials and see how many times they sponsored or supported education funding reform. Did they truly stand up for our children? I'm going to tell those parents that they need to hold those legislators accountable because I can't do it for them. And then I'm going to invite those parents to join me in the crusade to fix the single most pressing problem in the state of Illinois. And whether it takes one year or five years or more years than I have left on this earth, I'm going to keep pushing this issue as hard as I can. This is not just an education issue. This is about all of us. Whether you have children or not, own a home or pay rent, work for yourselves or others, or consider yourself a liberal or conservative, you have a stake in the outcome. Illinois' identity as a progressive and productive place to live and work and raise families is at risk as long as we allow the shameful condition to exist. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a fight for our future. It is a fight for our children. We must not let them down. Thank you. Taking advantage of Kathy Posner's one-day suspension, I'll ask the first question. Mr. Williams, I'm Joyce Saxon. I'm on the Board of Governors of City Club as well. You mentioned New York and the lawsuit that was successful, and the politicians had to give more money. Where'd they get it from? I asked the same question, and the answer that I got was that the governor found it. He had the courage to go in and make it happen. They put in a billion dollars in this first year, and they will continue to look for sources to continue to make it happen until their funding gets equal. So he found it. They did not raise taxes. They found it in their, in their current system. It was courage. And let me, before you, before you, I just want to say thank you all. I don't know whether you all stood up because I was finished. <laughs> or you stood up because you're going to stand with me as we go and fight for, for reform. But I do appreciate that. Thank you very much. Your second response was the correct one. I'm Walter Pildish from uh, representing a group here from the Retired Teachers Association. And I want to thank you for your participation over this past year, but even before, with all the many activities of the board. Uh, I particularly saw you at the Chicago Student Science Fair at the museum last, uh, last spring. That's the first time I've ever seen a president of the Board of Education at that event, and I've been there over 30 years helping with it. Uh, my concern, of course, is uh, retirement and pensions, and I see looming in the future, and I'm sure you do too, a $30 million payment to the pension fund. What was it last year? Now it's 80, and it's going to go up to 100, 200. It continually rises for many reasons. Um, what sort of plan is there besides, of course, getting more money from the state to fund this? Well, the plan is to get more money from the state. The question is how and where they're going to get it. I think, quite frankly, as the pension system runs and the Chicago Public Schools runs in that regard, we should get 30 percent of what's given to the Illinois State Pension Fund. Our records show that we have not been getting that. We are better funded than the state pension fund, but we're not funded at the level that we need to. And so we will have to go through whatever the measures are to help our legislature appreciate that they should b give more funding to the pension fund here. This is a huge issue for our system because the ramp up of the pension payments over the next 20 years has a direct effect on our operations and on the money that we have to give to our children. Certainly we appreciate and, and recognize the promises that have been made to teachers and those who have retired from our system. We want to make sure that we can honor those. At the same time, we need to make sure that we can do the best that we can for our students. So the only way that we get more money, and this is money that is due to us, this is money that is owed to us, and we will go through whatever measures we have to get through in order to get it. Uh, Mr. Williams, my name is Anthony Cole. I'm also on the Board of Governors here at the City Club of Chicago. 
And I'm thinking about your comments and some of the things I've read uh, from time to time. It's, it seems to me we have a class system here in America, and unfortunately it's being per perpetuated by the inequity of funding in, in the state of Illinois for schools. You, can have, you cannot have someone getting five or $10,000 and some, and some other student getting twenty dollars or $30,000 for educational resources and say so you have a fair system. It's not, an even, it's not a level playing field. So uh, one of the things I thought about is, as I listened to your comments, particularly today, you talked about various uh, vehicles and opportunities to rectify this kind of uh, arrangement, is perhaps look at it as a civil rights issue. Um, it, to me, uh, it's, a, it's a crime or a sin uh, to, to have this kind of equity in funding in, in, uh, in, in for individual school districts. So I'd like to uh, encourage you to perhaps at least look at that if you haven't already. Uh, similarly, uh, I think that um, Senator James Meeks, uh, you said, Perhaps you said who has done anything in the world, who's looked at it. I think Senator James Mix has put forth a bill in the legislation process, legislative process that looks at what you're talking about, trying to even out some of this, this funding around property taxes and things of that nature. I think that uh, his, his bill is worth reviewing again. Perhaps could, uh, impetus could be put behind that. And then lastly, I think perhaps, because I say I consider it a, personally a sin and, and possibly a crime, but I think you also ought to look at rallying the church community. I think this is wholly, wholly unfair that we have one set of students getting four or five thousand dollars or ten thousand, and another set of students getting three and four times the amount of funding. It does not make sense. I don't care what people say about parenting is the, is the issue. You give me more resources, I guarantee you I can do better. Thank you for your comments. I think all, and I agree with all of them. I think Senator Meeks has pushed forward something. You know, one of the things that we are very careful about is I can't and don't try to determine what those sources are. I think that's what our legislators are there to do. But I can certainly tell you that we are not at the level that we need to be in terms of resources for our children. It's very clear we have not gotten capital money from the state of, from the state of Illinois in four years. And it's very difficult to maintain schools, to build schools, to do basic things when you have that kind of a hole in what you need to do. So the issue of civil rights, the issue of equity, the issue of however we look at it, and I will tell you, we are examining all of those, and we will look at whatever front seems to make the most sense that we can get the most leverage on to try to make this thing work. Thank you. Yes, I'm William. I want to do three things. Make sure you know I'm here. State your name. Um, Let me state her name. This is Peggy <laughs> Davis, who was one of the board members, one of the seven board members of the Chicago Board of Education. <laughs> And she is an executive with Exelon Corporation as well. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I, I, I want to say thank you um, for your plain talk, for your leadership and your courage as we tackle the tough issues at Chicago Public Schools. I looked around the room when you were talking. I saw a lot of heads nodding. So I do think that you have a lot of support in this room. And the other thing is I'm prepared for a very long meeting next month, given your <laughs> remarks today. <laughs> That being said, because we had a really long meeting last month it's to really start to get our arms around this, and we're trying, we're trying very hard. We have some really big issues that we're dealing with, and this is one of our really big issues. So we now have stability in our system. We have our contracts done. We have our retired principals replaced. We are moving forward, and it's time now to grab traction and move. And move. So get ready for a lot of long meetings until we get this one done. Hi, my name is Ellen McGee. I'm with Clarity Partners. Also a former LSC chair, so I agree with your comments, you know, concerns about the local school council. Thank you. Um, all three of my children went to Chicago Public Schools. I'm glad to say that two of them are in college doing great. I have one in school now. Um, I think one of the concerns I have, and I was wondering what type of strategy you all have put forth. Um, my daughter's about to go to high school, and I want her to stay in Chicago Public Schools, but as you know, I mean, there are only limited choices for high schools for students. I mean, there are thousands of stu you know, students applying for the top schools like Whitney Young and Walter Payton. And it just, you know, there are about 200 high schools. And as you know, I mean, it's, it's like applying to get into college. And I'm just wondering what type of strategy you're putting together so that parents don't have to be so you know, concerned about this whole process of trying to get their child into, you know, a decent public high school so that they can then, you know, um, compete with other students 
across the country. I mean, this has to be a big concern for, for you all. It is. I'll say a few things. One, I recall when we were trying to get into preschool, that was like trying to get into college. <laughs> and then trying to get in high school was like trying to get into college. <laughs> and then trying to get into college was like trying to get into college. So you've got a little bit more to, to, to look at. The reality is this. We have some wonderful schools, and the names that always come up are Whitney Young and Walter Payton and Northside Prep. But then we often forget about Lane Tech, and we forget about Kenwood and we forget about some of these other schools that are great. We have a number of wonderful options in schools. We have wonderful military academies. We have Jones, which is an up and coming school that's moving very far down the track. We have King, which is doing the same thing. I think as you look closer, rather than just looking at the names that you often hear, we do have some wonderful options in schools throughout our system. I will also say, as people look and you think about whether you stay in the system or go out of the system, whether or not you get into those great schools, I went to Lane Tech in my freshman year. After my freshman year, I went to Orr High School. Orr is never on anyone's list as one of our best schools, but that's where I went. And I think I, think I did all right. I'm the president of the Board of Education. <laughs> so as you look at those things and you look at your, look at your child, and see where they go. A lot is going to happen because of what you do. I think what you also find in some of the places that may not seem like they're the best ones, they also give your, will give your child the best chance to really show who your child is and what your child can do. So don't look away from us. I mean, we're getting better at every step and we're getting better every moment. We have a laser focus on high schools. We are working hard right now all the time to try to make them better. High schools are our main focus right now, and we're going to get better at that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, as always, the City Club speaker gets the official City Club mug. Hey, mug. Uh, yeah. Rufus, the, the, the hits just keep on coming. Uh, City Club of Chicago history that was read by, uh, uh, recently read by somebody, so there you go, it's been read. Uh, yeah. And a one-year membership in the City Club of Chicago with the usual rejoinder after one year. I have to pay my own dues. Pay up. Uh, <laughs> remember, join the City Club. We have these things going all the time, and we are adjourned. Good job.